Hey guys, did you get a glimpse on what's on the whiteboard this week? Episode three. We're up to episode three, guys. My new educational series here using the whiteboard, a tool that you guys are very familiar with. Elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, right? We're getting right to the basics of how to buy a home, things you want to know during the process, and how to buy a home here with Great Homes ATL. So if you got a glimpse, what do you think that this topic is? It starts with a C. It's probably the most asked about question on our general consultations, our pre-approved consultations, in our DMs, in our comments. Credit. Credit is definitely the number one thing that people ask us about. It feels like sometimes it's actually the only thing people really worry about. Never mind the other items like down payment, income, closing costs, reserves. Credit is part of that formula and I encourage you, those five things I just talked to you about, make sure you go on our highlight section where it says Home Buyer Ed, where I broke down in great detail all those things. But I wanna focus on this issue that continues to come up. People wanna know what credit score do I need? That's literally the first question that we always get. What credit score do I need? Never mind how much money you make, what your debt levels are, all that kind of stuff. But let's jump into it. I'm going to do a two part series and how in the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about what you should expect during the loan process and how um, credit ties into it. But let's jump into it. And I, if I have time, I might even record a part three to talk to you about my number one issue when it comes to credit, which is no credit repair. I reiterate, are you getting hit up constantly? Are you hearing on the blogs? Are you have a friend that's also a barber, that's also in corporate America, that also is a dog walker, right? Everybody seems to be opening up their own credit repair business. And trust me, it is a business. And in part three, I think I'll tell you the story because it's not just what we've heard from other clients. We have real life examples of even us trying credit repair early on in our relationship and in our real estate career. So let's get with some basics here, guys. What credit scores are lenders looking for. So pretty much anything less than 579 is bad. How bad? It depends on how low under 580 it is. Typically guys, from a lender's perspective, again, these are mortgage banks, mortgage lenders, mortgage brokers that are going to lend out to you. The key word is lend, not give, right? Lend money to you and you have to look at your credit score as something that you would put on a resume, right? If you were going for a job, you wouldn't say, I don't have experience with this or I say I'm going for an administrative assistant uh, position. I don't know how to use anything that has Microsoft to it. I don't know how to type or speak proper grammar, right? You're not going to pretty much get that job. So it's the same case when it comes to your credit score. Typically people that have under 580 credit score, and we'll get into some of the details of what causes credit scores to go up or down, but it's basically telling you that you don't pay your bills, you don't have enough credit history, and you've been lax with anything that comes to about paying bills. So there typically, there's going to be, trust me, there's gonna be something called, and we've heard this term, predatory lending. There's going to be people that say, oh, I can do it. My cousin did. My my best friend got it. That's that's BS, right? That you could get it at 550, at 560, and anything in a case like, case like that. But what they're not going to tell you is they might not have qualified for certain programs. They might have paid an exorbitant interest rate. They might have had to sell their kids literally. Like, there's so much things that go that go bad when you have an under 580 credit score. 
The next range is going to be 580 to 619. I would say this is probably we were gonna we're gonna call this qualifying. Qualify, excuse my uh, handwriting here, but qualifying, that basically means, guys, that you're probably going to pay in the higher range of interest rates, but you do qualify. So if somebody maybe had a 450, 4, 525, and they really worked hard, not through credit repair, but through going to proper channels, which we'll talk about probably in episode, uh, part three of episode three. Um, you know, you'll, you'll probably qualify as long as your debt ratios are under 54%. But again, the overall message in this is as we go along, as we go higher, the lower the interest rate, the lower the origination fees and points that lenders will charge you. 620 to 679. This typically is a good range for FHA. And I would say this is a fair, um, credit score. Meaning that you're going to qualify, you've been doing a lot of things right, but maybe there's certain things like you've accumulated too much student loan debt, maybe your credit card ratios are a little higher, but it should not stop you from being a homeowner. You're still going to qualify for a pretty fair rate, and you know down the line you could always refinance as well. 680 to 739. I would say this is good. This is going to open you up to probably conventional mortgage if your debt ratios are about 45% or under. It's going to open you up to different grant programs and down payment assistance programs. And they're going to look at you as long as everything else. We just talked about the other four things, income, reserves, down payment, closing costs, line up. They're going to look at you as a pretty strong um, uh, borrower. So definitely this is a this is the range I would really shoot for. This would be the range that is going to take you to the next level. And then this is the ultimate here. 740 to 850. Great. You're doing everything that we're going to talk about over here down the line. That means basically, guys, in when it comes to mortgage lending, it doesn't matter if your score is 740, 745, or 850. You don't have to stress and be like, Oh, I really want to get it from 745 to like 805 because I'm going to get a better rate. Typically in mortgages, as long as you get to that 740, doesn't matter if you got to the 800s, you're pretty much going to be looked at in that same bucket. So I tried to put it into buckets for you. This is going to be the, you know, this is really showing the lender that you're serious, that you've been paying your bills on time, that you don't have anything really negative on your credit, that you're a good steward of your credit and you really are a trustworthy borrower. That's that's what you really want to go, you know, that's really what at the end of the day you want to show on paper to a mortgage lender. So where are they going to pull these credit scores? From the three credit bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, and Equifax, excuse me, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Now say there's just one person going for this loan. People ask all the time, well, what credit score are they going to use? So in this example, if there was somebody that had a score reported by TransUnion at 590, Experian at 640, Equifax at 642, they are going to look at the middle number. So you're going to fall in this bracket right here as a fair um, borrower of credit. So you want to make sure that all three credit bureaus are reporting accurately, but don't get so freaked out again if TransUnion is 590 and this one's 642 because they're going to take the middle of three scores. Now, people ask us again, what happens when two people are alone? This is what happens when, you know, it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, partner, maybe buying with their parent. We've had those scenarios as well. Um, and of course, married, you know, married couples. So what happens in those scenarios? So you can see that spouse number one has scores of 613, 620, and 642. Spouse number two has scores of 700, 712, 729. Now, most people would think, well, I will just say my spouse number two 
is the one we should go with, right? Because they have the better credit score. But in situations where, say, one spouse is making 75000 and the other spouse is making 50000 right? For the house that you're trying to qualify for, that $75,000 salary may not be enough. So you might need to combine both incomes. However, when you do that, they are going to take the lowest of the two people middle score. Why? Because, again, you're borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars. They want to see the two people that are going to be on this loan, who is more of a risk? And, of course, the person with the lower credit score. Now, people get so freaked out, right? Well, if I lower, I'm a bad person. Or, no, no, guys. We're going to talk about how to improve it. But just understand that from a lender's perspective, again, they are going to take the lowest of the two middle scores. Now, what happens sometimes, if one person in the family is like a breadwinner, like one person's making 150, the other person's maybe a part-time, you know, stay-at-home mom, something like that, where the income really doesn't matter. They can cut, you know, they can basically qualify with just the one person's income. Well, in that situation, it might make sense to use that spouse number two if they're the one that are making, say, the 150, because you're going to get a better interest rate. And in the event of a death or something like that, it won't go to probate court as long as that spouse is added to the title. So you want to make sure in those situations, as our clients, we always remind you, hey, if it's your husband, wife, partner, whatever the case may be, if you're legally married or you have a child, you could add them to the title so it does not go to probate court. So consider that, guys. Be honest. These are honest conversations to have as a couple. Now, what happens, guys, in the worst case scenario? What are we trying to avoid? Why am I doing this education? Because on your credit, if you go into foreclosure or short sale, that is going to stay on your credit for seven years. It's crazy. But it makes sense. You defaulted. You didn't pay off the mortgage and you defaulted and you started missing payments. Bankruptcy. You get these on the radio all the time. Oh, just file for Chapter 13, Chapter 11, Chapter 7, whatever it is. Guys, it stays on your credit for 10 years. So the next question, we've had this, obviously, being mortgage brokers. I never understood when people said, hey, I just filed bankruptcy six months ago, which means I can't pay my bills. A lot of stuff was wiped out, but now I want to buy a house. Well, it's not going to happen because it takes two years and one day from that bankruptcy starting where lenders will, again, consider you, not approve you, consider you. Because what have you done since the bankruptcy? Have you started to pay your bills on time? Have you started to rebuild? Have you shown, um, shown that? you are financially uh, stable and thriving again. And no matter what, even if you can qualify, guys, this will stay on your credit for 10 years. So listen to this so you don't have to go through it. What are the things that will affect your credit score? If you have no credit, people say all the time, hey, Mark, I'm scared of American Express MasterCard. I don't trust myself with it. Trust yourself with it and prove to yourself. You're going to need to if you're going to take on a mortgage, right? The worst thing that you can do is have no credit or credit history. Of course, the two obvious is, obvious um, things about your credit score, if you miss payments or you have late payments, you watch how fast that people have 700 credit scores and just stop paying a credit card bill for one or two months. That credit score will jump down to like 610 real quick. It will take you forever to go back up. The next thing, high usage versus credit line. So I think I'm going to talk about this because we're running out of time in this video. I want to jump a little bit more into this and I have something on the other side. But before we end on it, just take these. I want you to write it down yourself. What are your credit lines when you go to American Express, MasterCard? If they Are they giving you 5000 Are they giving you 10000 Are they giving you 1000 And how much? is your usage rate. We're going to jump into that in part two and talk about the goals that you should try to get to to up that credit score. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed part one of episode three. Stay tuned for part two, where we got a lot to talk about. Talk to you soon.